God, thank you, music ministry. Please remain standing as we read God's word together. We are in Matthew chapter 16. And we're looking at the same verses we looked at last week, which is uh, verses uh, 16 through 18. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you give us eyes of faith as we study your word, and that your Holy Spirit is preaching truth to all of our hearts. May we be convicted and renewed through the reading of your word. May we be edified and uplifted as well, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. may be seated. We are having a study on the church. That's what we're focusing on. This is kind of the area where uh, uh, we're going to slow down and really reflect on what is the church. Um, we, way far back early on in Matthew, we, we kind of mentioned that um, we will be discussing, we will do an in-depth study of what the church is, but we were waiting until we approached this verse because of the very words that our Lord says. So we're having a study on the church, on the Ecclesia, that is the Greek word uh, that is in the very text that we are looking at today. And when we began this study, I stated that the, the church has so much history behind it. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of activities that have taken place within the scope and the history of the church. There's there's so much to study when it comes to the what is taking place after the New Testament to this point in time we are sitting at now. And that the study of church history is something that's not typically, it's not typically valued or appreciated. But one thing we gather when we look at the history of the church, there's one consistent theme when we look at the history of church. You see, there's, there's always been movements, there's always been, there's always been different fads, there's always been different uh, um, what was popular, there's always been different dilemmas. But the one consistent thing that has always existed for the church is that the church has always faced opposition. Always. There has never been a time in church history where the church was not facing opposition. The church has always been fighting. The church has always been taking a stand on truth. To some degree or another. The church even gave up their lives to defend truth truth. Now think about that for a second. Think about that very statement. There was a point in time where people were willing to give up their lives for the truth. And we live in a day where people are not even willing to give up a Sunday for truth. Reflect on that for a second. But one thing we can say that has been absolutely consistent of church history is that the church has always faced opposition. The people of God have always been fighters. The people of God have always been fierce defenders of the truth, always. When the Council of Nicaea gathered together in 325 A.D., It was the first time the church kind of really saw this unity. It was the first time the church was really gathered in that way, uh, because which is what makes that date and that moment so monumental in in church history. Uh, With Constantine winning the battle for for the the right to be called emperor, he gave Christians peace and freedom to gather. That's what Constantine provided. He was giving them a moment of peace. And the Council of Nicaea was that, that image. It was kind of that proof. He was, he was going to put a stop to persecution against the church. At least that's what uh, he thought at that moment in time. He didn't actually fully stop. But in the, in the persecution of the church, there was, there, was, there was a major obstacle for the church. It wasn't just the persecution, but there were false teachings. There were, there were wolves everywhere. 
And the church had to take a stand and define what certain truths meant. And there were multiple heresies taking place during this time. There were so many different types of heresies. But the one that was very common back when the Council of Nicaea gathered was that there was always attack on God the Father, and then there was attack on who Jesus was as a person, on, on, on the person of Jesus himself. It attacked Jesus in many different ways, in many different forms. Some claimed that he was not divine at all. Some claiming that he is not everlasting, that he's not truly the Son of God. Uh, there was a time where he did not exist. That was one of the main argue, uh, battles uh, during the Council, Council of Nicaea. There were so many claims about Jesus and so many teachings about Jesus that were contrary to Scripture. And then there was a teaching that the Father, God the Father, the God of the Old Testament, was essentially not a good God. That rose up too. And so when the council of Nicaea gathered together and when they met, it was, it was a council to determine what is truth, what is, what is Scripture teaching here, what is, what is, uh, how are we going to defend these things. And so there was a specific emphasis. They had a specific emphasis based on the heresies that were taking place in that time. It was simply because that's, that's what they were facing in their day. That was the trouble of their day. And so there was an area of focus because that's where they had to take the strongest stand. So to quote from the Nicene Creed, which came from that Council of Nicaea, it says this, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Makes the emphasis, we believe in one God. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before, before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Now that's the opening statement of the Nicene Creed. And you can see just from that opening statement that there is this emphasis, and that emphasis is on God the Father and Jesus being divine, and everlasting that's where they put their area of focus on because that was the trouble they were facing in their day so some people sit this side of history and they say hey the early church fathers didn't address x y and z so if what you were saying today is true why didn't the early church fathers address x y and z well that's because that really wasn't the core of the issue that they were facing in their time. First of all, we don't have every single written thing from every single church father. We also don't have every single sermon. We don't know of every single sermon that was ever preached. But the reason why certain things weren't mentioned because it wasn't necessarily the battle they were faced with. A lot of the writings we see had to do with what was their opposition that they were facing with in that point in time. They had to defend the truth of who Jesus was before they can move on to another issue that, they, that somebody today might be speaking about. Whenever we read from somebody from the past, we have to include the culture of where they came from. The context of what they are saying doesn't make a whole lot of sense if we're not willing to understand the cultural context of why they're saying what they're saying. By the way, the same is true of Scripture. But this is something we don't do. We don't look at the Bible and we say, okay, you know what? This had an intended meaning to a, a, an intended audience, and we must understand it the way that that audience would have understood it. We're not concerned with that. No, we're more concerned with how the scriptures are meant to be understood uh, to me today now in this specific situation that I am in. I need to know how it affects me here and now according to this specific situation that I'm facing right at this very moment. So it's absolute of great importance that we recognize the church has always faced opposition. Always. And the church has always been a place where they had to take a stand where they had to go against the culture head on. And with every generation of believers, there are specific fights that they will be known for. There are specific fights that will take place. You know, the Reformation was a specific fight. 
and they're known for specific things. Every generation will face that. Every church age will face that. When we look at the grand history of the church, we see some heresies rise up, rise up and then they fade away. And then we see new ones begin and they rise up and they fade away. And over time, what we could kind of gather is, when we look at the timeline of history, hey, a lot of these heresies, they're just recycled. They're kind of just the same old recycled thing. They're the same old heresy. They're just kind of dressed up a little differently this time. The same old ancient heresy, but presented in a slightly new way. I mean, if we were going to take the examples from modern day marketing, it would be a, a same taste, new package. That's what it is. It is of my belief that we are living in a time where the church is faced with the demand and we have to take a stand on a specific doctrine i think one of our greatest greatest stances we have to take is going to be on the doctrine of the church and we have been living in that time for some time when you look at the way ministries are functioning, when you look at what they are doing, when you see uh, how they are organized, when you see the presentation of certain sermons, when you see some of the things that are being said, the area, one of the areas where we are going to be forced to take the strongest stance on is going to be the doctrine of the church herself. We are reaping the harvest right now of laziness, of sinfulness, of Satanist. These things that we have been witnessing for some time, these things are, are have been go, they've been going on for a while. They've been going on for some time. We're not, we're not facing anything really new, but we're seeing the benefit of it all now. We're seeing, we're seeing the, the, the rotten fruit of it all now. For some time, there have always been voices that have been heeding a warning. There's always been voices of truth that have been giving the warning. They, 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 they've, they've taken a stand. They, they, they told us, you've got to watch how you do this because it's going to lead down a very bad road. We did not heed that warning. And it would appear that that warning is still not being heard. And it's evident in the way the people treat the church. I remember my pastor years ago had a church member that had a severe disagreement with him. Now, what that disagreement was, I do not know. I don't know what it was over. But what led to a very private conversation, it was started off as a private conversation, escalated, came out of the private room, and then it eventually led to an argument in front of churchgoers. Started off as private, then escalated. The man was very upset. He was a wealthy man, too. He was a very wealthy person. Very successful person. And the pastor was trying to, I, I, you know, trying to de-escalate the situation with no success. He was trying to calm him down. Trying to be reasonable with him to a degree, I believe. But the man was not getting his way. And so the conversation carried from the front carried from the office to the front of the office into the foyer area, eventually down to the stairs, eventually leading to a combative argument in the parking lot, eventually leading to the, 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 the wealthy man being in his car, still arguing with his window down. And he eventually told the pastor this while he was in his car, while the window was down in front of many witnesses. He says, if you do not make these changes, then I am taking my money and I'm going somewhere else. Those were his very words. Now, this was a man that I uh, that uh, was never a person that flaunted his wealth. It was, he was a man that never bragged about his wealth in any way. He has never had a reputation for that. He was never known for that. But in that moment, in that moment, he apparently had the attitude that his wealth made his position important. And if the church was not going to abide by that, then he will just take his money and go somewhere else. Now, again, I do not know what the argument is over. And for all I know, he could have been fighting a fight that was worthy of fighting. I don't know. 
But then again, maybe he wasn't. But regardless of what it was over, there was a specific attitude at hand in the words he said. That I will take my money and go somewhere else. And that is the underlying attitude that our postmodern influence generation has. To belong to a church, to be a member of the church, is not a thing of relative importance to the modern churchgoer. It bears no conviction. It bears nothing upon the modern churchgoer. No. What we are going to do is we are going to treat the church like Walmart. There is no difference between the church and between Walmart. Give me service, give me satisfaction, give me what I want, or I will take my money and I will go somewhere else. And the very reasons why we have these attitudes, that we approach the church this way, is because we are at the church for very selfish reasons. We attend church for all the wrong reasons. I cannot tell you how many times people have approached me or who have called me or have warned me that a specific person is go coming to church that Sunday and that, that person has this specific issue going on in their life. So, Pastor, you better preach a sermon on that this Sunday because he's going to be there. I've had that request from strangers, by the way. People have called up and they said, hey, I plan on visiting your church this Sunday, and my, my son-in-law is going to be there, or someone, some family member is going to be there. And uh, you know what? This is what the, he got going in his life, so uh, preach a sermon on that when we show up. The people who make such requests have no idea what sermon preparation is about. They know absolutely nothing about sermon preparation. But it's that same attitude. It's that same attitude. That attitude comes from the same place as I'll take my money and go somewhere else. I could just call up the preacher, make the request, and it will be done. And if it's not done, oh, you ain't getting nothing from me. I will have satisfaction. You will present to me what I desire, what I want. And if you do what I want, hey, maybe I'll throw a little extra in the collection plate. We'll see how you do. Let's see, let's see if my bozo son-in-law is fixed by the end of your sermon. And if he is, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kick in a few more. We think that the church is a place that we come to so that we may be served by the people who work in the church. That's what we think. Now, when we gather together in here, when we come together in here, it's for the purposes of being fed, right? Wrong. No. That is not why we are here. And that's the same attitude. When we come in here and go, I'm in here to be fed, that's the same attitude. Abandon that line of thinking. Forget about it. It is sinful. It is still focused on us. I need to be fed. I'm not getting the feeding. Now, don't get me wrong. We get fed. That's a benefit. But that is not the purpose of why we come here. That is not the purpose behind what we do. Let me make it really clear. So we're all on the same page on what we do here. When the ecclesia gathers together, we are here to worship God and worship him alone. That's it. it is, we are not doing it so that we can get fed. It is not for the benefit so we may receive something. That is not the motive behind us gathering together. It is so... It is not so I can be a better husband. It's not so you can be a better husband, a better father. It's not so you can be a better mother or a better wife. That is not why we gather. We gather to worship God. And that is the number one priority and motivation for gathering together to worship. It is to worship our holy God. If you say anything else in addition to that, your priorities are wrong. 
the number one priority is to be one body gathering together to worship our holy God. But we see this intense individualism and this intense attitude of independence brought together by our postmodern view of, hey, what is truth anyway? Or truth is relative, mixed in within, within this sentimental language that we use in our day and this emotionalism that, that is used so often for ministries to manipulate us all. We are losing the fight, and, and we can no longer call so many of these ministries something proper. We are losing the fight against proper teaching of the church. To the point where we don't even know the importance of the church. We don't understand the relevance of the church. We don't comprehend the importance of doing it right. I mean, there are ministries out there who proclaim there's no wrong way to worship. Yes, there is. There absolutely is. There's ministries out there. There's no wrong way to pray. Yes, there is. And to have all of this corrected, all the damage we have done over the last hundred years or more is going to take many years. Beyond my lifetime, I am convinced. Just this week, we heard loud and clear from the Southern Baptist Convention. And if you're wondering why so many eyes are on the Southern Baptist Convention, it's because they are the largest conservative Protestant denomination in name, in title. It's not just, it's not just telling of the Southern Baptist Convention, it's telling of evangelicalism in general. And so many people have departed from certain biblical truths, not all. There are still some wonderful brothers in the SBC, some wonderful people in there. But this week we've seen that they are the minority. It is now to the point where the SBC this very week had to ask the question, what is a pastor? This is going to be the, the shoe-in for women pastors, by the way. That's why they're asking this question. What is a pastor? What is a pastor anyway? Postmodernism, what is truth? Truth is relative. What is a pastor? We live in a culture where everyone's asking, what is a woman? And now the SBC is asking, what is a pastor? Their, their statement of faith, their very statement of faith has it clear on what defines a pastor. But they're going to play that postmodern, vague language and play, you know, like, well, can, can, how, how can we really interpret this, this statement of faith? Is, this, is there a way we can interpret this to mean uh, something else? And in other words, what they're going to do is they're going to look at the statement of faith and they're going to run it through their leftist filter and they're going to go, here's how I interpret the statement of faith. And they'll find a way because that's what leftists do. Redefine words, reinterpret things, call it something else. We're losing. But reflecting on those words of Jesus again last week, we looked at, when we looked at this, we, we were looking at it in context of what is being communicated here. Peter is making a declaration of faith that is beyond what anyone else has made up until this point. And Jesus tells him, that he is blessed for making such a statement because it was not something that was re revealed to him by flesh and blood, but it was revealed to him by the Father who is in heaven. And Jesus now states that he shall be called Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And that rock that he's going to build, uh, build it on is the rock of the confession of faith that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from that, Christ will build his church. Those who have the same authentic confession that Peter has, uh, uh, that, uh, that have the same confession of faith, that they share in the same faith that Peter has, it is the very foundation that Christ will build his church. It is Christ built, therefore it is Christ owned. 
And that's what we covered last week. But one of the important things that we covered last week is that those who make this same declaration that Peter is making, those who have the same authentic faith that Peter has, is something that is revealed to us by the Father who is in heaven. Those who have that have that same miraculous working within them that Peter has. Those who have that same miraculous working within them also now are united in Christ through faith. We are united to Christ in faith and that is why we have an emphasis on justification by faith alone, because there, by faith we are united to Christ. Not faith that we worked up, not faith that we've stirred up within ourselves, but a faith that is a gift from God to us. And so we are united to Christ because of faith. And because we are united to Christ, we are now united together. All who are united to Christ are united together. And that is the ecclesia. That is what Jesus is building. His people. And so that is the area where we are going to pick up back on and have our focus is being united together. And what that means and what it means biblically to be united to each other through our unity in Christ. Now, as we reflect on those words in verse 18, I will build my church. We cannot forget the word church. The, the English rendition of that word uh, has a long line of, of different languages that it's coming from, but it literally means belonging to the Lord. That's what the word means, belonging to the Lord. The Greek usage of the word, though, uh, ekklesia, means the gathering of the people. But in the context of what Jesus is saying, he's not saying, I will build just any people. He says, I'm going to build my people. I will build my gathering of people. So it's not just a gathering for the sake of gathering that Jesus built. No, he's building his own. Those are important details. Those are important facts that actually mean something. This means that the church is something we cannot mistreat and take lightly. If it is Christ-built and Christ-owned, then it is something that we cannot mistreat or take lightly, which is what we have been doing. It must be treated with great reverence. And as we continue, I want to remind you all of Hebrews chapter 10. Last week we just looked at verse 25, but let's look at verses 19 through 25. Let's put, let's, let's put it into context. Hebrews chapter 10 Verses 19 through 25. Choo choo. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, pay attention, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another. Yeah, together? Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Pay attention. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Not only do we gather to encourage and lift each other up and stimulate one another and share the same confession, but we increase on this all the more. Now, these are all the commands the author of Hebrew is saying, let us draw near with a sincere heart. He says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, and let us consider how we stimulate one another in, uh, to love and good deeds. And then the command comes in, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. This is a command. When we talk about church membership, it is not the same as becoming a member at Sam's Club. It's not the same thing. We're not talking about the same thing. 
What we are doing is we are submitting ourselves to a local body for accountability. We are submitting ourselves to a local body so that we may be encouraged, stirring each other up in good things, sharing in a confession of hope. There are so many people out there who proclaim, I don't see a biblical argument for church membership. Well, that's only true if your idea of membership is similar to becoming a member at Sam's Club. And that's not what this is. It's not what benefits do I receive if I become a member here today. It is I'm submitting myself to the body of Christ for accountability and to hold others accountable as well. For the encouragement and an enrichment of each other. But one thing is absolutely clear when we look at the pages of Scripture. And hear me on this, folks. There is no such thing as an unchurched Christian. Does not exist in the pages of Scripture. Nor is it encouraged. Not once will you find this encouragement. This is something that the New Testament church understood. This is something that the early church understood. None of us in here will have a single idea. We don't have the slightest clue of what it's like to travel a great distance on foot in 95 AD in the middle of the dense woods at night where you cannot see just to gather together and worship free of persecution. And yet the people of God did that very thing. Being added to the church and being gathered with the church, is a, it, it, it's assumed in the pages of Scripture with the believer. That's really the point of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just to highlight a few verses, look at verses 11 through 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 through 21. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. That is God, just as God wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desires, that is, just as God desires. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. That is, the, the, the assumption here is unity. The discouragement is being is 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 you cannot detach yourself. It's not only members of the body can't behave outside of what they, they are called to behave, that they have a they, they have a function, that they're meant to behave a certain way, but members of the body will suffer if they separate themselves from the function. If the hand separates itself from the body, it will wither and die. That's the point that's being made here. Not only is it you're not meant to be detached from the body, but you have a specific purpose within that body. We covered that last week as well. And this has emphasized so much the importance of unity and the importance of gathering. Here's another thing. Membership, is, uh, being, uh, membership being joined to a body is essential for loving Christ. 
We see that Christ loves, uh, we see that Christ loves his church, that he gave his life for her. What does it say of us when we, re when we reject the one Christ loves? What does it say of us when we, re when we reject the gift that was meant for our good? This is a gift from God. And what does it say of us when we reject that very gift? But again, so many here, so many are within ministries, within churches for all selfish reasons. They attend for all the wrong reasons. They are shopping for a good church that fits them. Rather than a church that worships God and does it rightfully, but it's how does this church fit me? I don't know how many times I hear people, you got to find a church that fits you. And the growing attitude and the great reason why we need to be stronger with the, with the doctrine of the church is that we need, to be, we need to be more caring when it comes to the church. We, uh, we need to be more sincere when it comes to the doctrine of the church. We need to have more reverence when it comes to the doctrine of the church. Because there are so many people who are proclaiming obedient faith to Christ while rejecting the church. Think about this. They are, they are proclaiming an obedient relationship to Christ while rejecting the church. Now, this has always been an issue. But it's, 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 it's a growing issue. And we're seeing it more and more today. A study was just released. There are more unchurched people today than any other time in history. Here's a great, here's a great quote from Charles Spurgeon. Talking about this very same thing in the 1800s. He says, I know there are some who say, well, I've given myself to the Lord, but I don't intend to give myself to any church. I say, now why not? And the answer, because I can be just as good a Christian without it. I say, are you quite clear about that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to your, Lord, to your Lord's commands as being obedient? I don't believe you are answering the purpose for which Christ saved you. You are living contrary to the life in which Christ would have you live, and you are much to blame for the injury you do. Ouch. But he raises a good point. How can a follower of Christ proclaim that they can be an obedient Christian and a faithful Christian and just as good of a Christian while living in disobedience? How does that work? But there are other commands for the Christians that are in violation. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Here's the command. Ready? Obey your leaders and submit to them. They're talking about church leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls and those who will give an account let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. How can you obey the ruling elders? How can you submit to the elders if you are not a part of the church? How does that act of obedience take place? There is a command to obey the ruling elders, but you have separated yourself from the church. You cannot be obedient to that command. Impossible. We have the command that we must, that the people who proclaim faith in Christ must participate in the Lord's Supper. And when they do participate in the Lord's Supper, they must not do it in vain. These are commands to believers alone. If we are proclaiming a faith in Christ, and you do not partake of the Lord's Supper, you are in sin. This is not debatable. And if you are proclaiming a faith in Christ, and you do partake of the Lord's Supper, but you do it in vain, you are in sin. Therefore, committing an act of disobedience. So, not being together and united in the church is actually adding to your guilt. You are adding to your disobedience. 
You were not being faithful to the Lord's Supper. You were not being faithful to the Lord. If you neglect the Lord's Supper or if you take, take it in vain. And see, there's this common thinking among believers that, you know what, it's not possible for me to mistreat the Lord's table if I never take the Lord's table. I can't risk doing it in vain if I never partake of it. But not taking it is just as bad as taking it in vain. Because not taking the Lord's Supper because of your actions, because of the things you're doing, because you, you, you know you got something going on in your life, and you're, you, if you were to partake of it, you would know you'd be, you'd be partaking of it in vain. That is a clear-cut sign that you are unrepentant. You have not repented. You have an unrepentant heart. So if the thinking is, I will not partake this supper because it's neither good or safe because I will risk doing it in vain. I will not partake of this supper because it's neither good or safe. I mean, it's as if you're looking at two different swords and you're trying to figure out which one do I want to jump on? Which one of these swords do I want to jump on? That's what you're doing to yourself. Which sword is the better sword to fall on and bleed out? You are not obedient to the call of corporate worship. If you're looking at Colossians 3.16, it sums it up. We are gathered together. The word of Christ, proclaim it so it can richly indwell within us that we can admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. This is corporate worship. It's a command given in the pages of Scripture. And it's a command you cannot be faithful to if you reject the church. A rejection of the church and proclaiming obedience to Christ is a contradiction. It does not work that way for the life of the believer. To paraphrase Charles Hodge, to behave as an independent Christian separated from all other Christians is inconsistent with the pages of Scripture. It is inconsistent with the commands of Scripture. It is an oxymoron. It is an inconsistent description of the Christian. And it does not exist in the New Testament. Now, to be properly obedient to our Lord means we are to have a proper view of the church in the first place. But this isn't happening. This isn't being taught. This isn't being instructed. <clears throat> it's not being instructed by our ministers. It's not being instructed by our parents. It's not. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we are clueless about the importance of the church and what she is here for. I remember years ago, I made a social media post talking about the church. For the life of me, I can't remember what the statement was that I made. It didn't have anything to do with like a local church or any denominations. It had nothing to do with like any local gathering. It was a post where I was talking about the body of Christ in general. And it was a post that I intended to be more uplifting. And it was evident that I was speaking about that there was only... There's, there, 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 that, that there was one person who was unaware of this difference. He did, that, that, that people were unaware of the difference between the, 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 the local body and the, like the body of Christ. And if you were reading that post and you were aware of the doctrine of the church, you would know... Uh, what I was doing, where I was coming from. And one of my wife's family members claimed, chimed in and said, well, that all depends on the type of church you were going to, then the type of preacher, and uh, what type of things are being taught in that specific church. And he had this whole list of exemptions. And the more I kept reading his response, the worse my head hurt. Just, yeah, it, the cringing got more intense for me. 
I had to explain to that person, I had to clarify uh, what I was talking about, what, what was actually being said, and which I got no response. This was a man who was raised by Christian parents and didn't have a single clue of what I was speaking about when it came to the church. Believe me when I say this issue goes far before us. When we understand the purpose of the church and when we understand uh, the true doctrine of the church, then we understand our purpose. We understand our purpose when we gather together. We understand our purpose when we raise our own families and when we communicate to other people. The very purpose for us to gather together is to worship our holy God. That's what we are doing here. It's not to be fed. It's not to be entertained. It's not so we can look at all these silly reasons that people want to look for a good church. There are people out there who will gladly sit under false doctrine, under false teaching, that, hey, you know what? This church has a good nursery. I'm sticking around. There are people who will gather at a church that preaches error, that preaches falsehood, but you got to hear the worship band. You just got to. There are people who will gather in churches where the entire ministry has almost perverted the view of covenant theology and covenants in the Bible, but the preacher said something against homosexuality, so he's a good guy. Oh, you should have heard him speaking against the gays that day. Yeah, that's a solid preacher because he says something. Despite the false theology, he's spitting out every other day. Pastor, when I come in here, I, I need to feel lifted up. I need to feel like my sorrows have been washed away. I need to feel like I've gained something. I need to feel like I've been fed. I need to feel like I have been uplifted. I need to feel like I've been encouraged. I need to have a positive outlook uh, to begin this week, to even start this week. I need to feel happy. I need to feel joy. I need to feel comfort. Yikes, that's a lot of you. Holy smokes, did we leave room for God? I mean, is this the church of God or is this the church of you? We're not here for any of those things. If you feel encouraged, if you feel positive, if you feel happy, if you feel joy, if you feel comfort, if you feel uplifted, I'm happy for you. I'm not trying to discourage you from any of those feelings. But that emotionalism and that sensationalism has nothing to do with why we gather here. We are here to worship our holy God. It's not about our emotions. It's not about our feelings. It's not, not a, and none of that is the main goal. Our main goal when we gather together is to rightfully worship God. You have any other reasons other than that your priorities are wrong and you are committing an act of idolatry and if you can honestly tell yourself I mean let's just be honest with ourselves you don't got to say nothing to me let's just be honest with ourselves yes some of the things you have listed are the reasons why I went to church in the past some of those things you've listed are the very reasons why I attended specific churches Some of those reasons you listed are the very reasons why I've hopped around to other churches. None of it had anything to do with any theology, had nothing to do with any doctrines, whether they were right or wrong, false or not, had nothing to do with that, had everything to do with the very things you've listed. If you can be honest with yourself and say, yes, that has taken place in the past, then repent. Tell God, sorry for making worship about me. And not making it about you. I'm confident if the people of God make their priorities everything of God. Then the feelings that they're trying to temporarily patch up. That they're superficially chasing. When the the worship is real. When it's authentic. When it's not manipulated by me. When we are submitting ourselves to the local church. That is a 
a, a, a sound local church, that is. Then we will experience those emotions as a blessing and not as us chasing it and striving for it. And we, when we do all of those things, when we submit ourselves to the local church, a sound local church, it is an act of obedience to God. You are proclaiming that I am joining to submit myself in sanctification. And that is where we encourage each other in spiritual things and in accountability. Which means when you fall and when you fail, we are here to hold you accountable and lift you up. And when you are doing acts of righteousness, then we continue to encourage you. Good job. Keep it up. Praise God. And it's these very things that people are trying to avoid. They're trying to avoid accountability. You know what? I don't need these people peddling in my life. I don't need those people knowing me in any way. They don't need to be involved in me in any way. The very gift that God gave, we're saying, "Uh uh-uh. On this rock, I will build my gathering of people. Those are the words of our Lord. And if it is Christ who is taking us in his hands like this, and he's gathering his people And he wants his people together, and he calls it holy, and he calls it good. And one of those people decides, no, it's not. It is not good for me to be here. Like this, right? Christ is gathering his people. He is building his church. And the attitude of professing believers is like, nope, I will remove myself because I'm far better over here. If you honestly think when Christ is doing this for his people gathering together and you do this and you still think that's obedient, you are fooling yourself. This is demonic. This is absolutely foreign to the New Testament church. Does not exist. In no way is this encouraged. But we have been called by God into holy service, and he calls us his ecclesia. He calls us a holy nation. He calls us a royal priesthood. And folks, because what I'm presenting here to you today and what I presented last week and and what I'm going to continue to present in the weeks to come is from Scripture, one thing we have to conclude There is only one logical conclusion. Our entire schedule must surround worship. If we have the attitude, you know what? The church really doesn't fit into my schedule. Really should be held on a different day. Should we really be held at a different time or whatever? You know, schedules are not vibing. I got things going on. The game's on on Sunday. I got family over on Sunday then your scheduling has the wrong priorities and you are in the wrong. Our entire scheduling for the week must be worked and managed according to worship. Everything that we do, everything that we schedule must surround the gathering of saints. This is where our priority lies first. We are united to Christ, and because we have been united to Christ, we have been united to each other. And I want to leave you with this last quote from from William Dell, the Puritan, William Dell. He says this, The church is the communion of the saints, which is the communion believers have with one another. Not in the things of the world or in the things of man, but in the things of God. For as believers, uh, for as believers have their union in the Son and in the Father, so in them also they have their communion in the communion they have with one another. In God cannot be their own things, but in things, even in his light, life, righteousness, wisdom, truth, love, power, peace, joy. This is the true communion of saints. And this communion of saints is the true church of God. 
We are not done speaking on this topic. There's more to learn. The church is in depth with richness and goodness. And you may be surprised on how much we are going to study when it comes to the church. And the only reason why any of us would be surprised is because we have never been instructed or counseled in this area. There was a point in time where this was not a surprising teaching. There was a point in time where this was strongly encouraged. But today, it's all about how we feel. And the doctrine of the church makes people uncomfortable. Making statements, submitting to your elders, makes people uncomfortable. Those are the words of our holy Lord. Holding each other accountable makes people uncomfortable. Finding out that you are not here for yourself makes people uncomfortable. It really does. But this is the truth of God's word. And we reflect on the very words, I will build my church. Therefore, we obey the one who is doing the building. Not our own emotions or sensations. But the one who is doing the gathering and the building. Which is Christ himself. Let's pray. Oh, Father God. You have listened to my prayers and you have heard my heart for many years when it has come to the condition of the church. You have brought me into this very position that I am in now because you knew the heart I had for your church. And Lord, never forget how much, never let us forget how much you love your assembly. So let us approach this with great reverence with great respect, with great obedience, and reflect on the errors of our ways and lead us to repentance. For repentance is good. And, and though at times it may sting, Lord, we, we will grow closer to you uh, through it and because of it. May you work in our hearts always. And may we always be encouraged by the truth of your word. We thank you for the verses that we have covered today. We thank you for the truth of your word. I pray, Lord, that it's edifying and that our hearts are just ignited with awestruck goodness as we reflect on our disobedience and work towards obedience through your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.